We are so thankful that you have made the choice to tune in for one of ACC's messages. You know, as you're listening and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. If you're sitting at your phone or at your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag, you belong at ACC, as God is teaching you different things during this message. You belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means that we would love to have you join us during one of our Sunday services at 710 Aqua Heart Road. We would love to have you jump into this message and we are believing God is going to do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, church. Hey, my name is Mike Miller. I'm one of the pastors here. If we haven't had a chance to meet, I'd love to meet you out in the lobby after the service. Uh, but like, was it a, m- a month and a half or so ago? I think the last time I was up here speaking uh, it was three days after my sinus surgery. And I had to slow down a lot because otherwise I'd start dripping blood. <laughs> Uh, today, I, I don't have any issues like that, but I have a lot to say, so uh, hold on to your seats. There's going to be a lot said in a short amount of time, and so I'm going to be talking fast. But we are starting a seven-week series, and we'll be talking about different topics that will truly unlock the power of what a spiritual family is uh, in this series called I Will Build My Church. This series is all about God's plan for a broken world and how you were created to belong to God and then to his family, the local church. This series is based off of a scripture that you're going to hear repeated throughout the the entire series. In the next seven weeks, you'll hear this over and over again. I'll be surprised if you don't remember it by then. It's Matthew 16, verses 18. It says, Now I say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. I want you to hear something. Hear this and remember this from me today, that the Lord's, uh, the, the local church is God's plan A. And he doesn't have a plan B because plan A always works. It's God's plan. He doesn't need it. And so we always, you know, we hear people say things like, I don't have to go to church all the time. I don't have to go to church at all. I am the church. I'm a Christian. I believe I am the church, you know, and and I want you to hear me out. That that just is not true. That's bogus. That's, that's, That's not true at all because you need to be in church. You need to be connected to the local church body because together we make up the church. It's all of us, not you by yourself, not you and your family alone, your family unit. That's not the church. The church comes from a term called ecclesia. And this term ecclesia means called out ones. It means an assembly of God's people. And so one person isn't a church. Uh, just you and your family is not a church. You have to be, you need to be in church. It's important to be in church and connected to the local church as often as you can. So this, t- today's message is titled, A Church That Prays. And with that being said, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, I pray, Lord, that you would uh, just, you would speak to our hearts today, Father, that you would show us what it means to be a church, that you would show us what it means to be the church, Father. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would teach us to pray the way that you taught your disciples. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Let me start by asking you all a question real quick. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? I'd say that a majority of you probably do. Uh, but, you know, you believe that God hears your prayers. You, maybe you've seen it in your own life uh, or you heard about it. Maybe you've, you've read about it on social media from your friends and family that are Christians and stuff and that they pray. And, you know, how many of you would say, now be honest and don't lie because you're sitting in church, uh, that you probably don't pray as often as you should. I'll raise my hand up on that one, too, with you. You know, the truth is that we believers, we we know about it. We know about prayer. We know how important it is. We know that Jesus did it a lot. But unfortunately, many times prayer becomes a last resort and not a first response. It becomes a last resort and not a first response. Today, I want to make a case for you as believers, uh, as, as, as a church body, really, that prayer would not be a last resort but it would be a way of life for those who believe. So how many of you feel like your prayers aren't that effective? There's been times where I feel like that. You don't have to raise your hands on that one. But you know, maybe you've experienced a time where you've prayed for something and, and you weren't really sure what to do, but you sort of just stepped out and prayed and, and, and then you didn't have the results that you'd receive. And that's a little disappointing, right? You know, growing up as a pastor's kid and then being in ministry as a pastor, I'm in this unique role where I get to, I get to hear about people's prayers, uh, about, you know, the prayers that, they, that have that they've, it's been answered for them and prayers that haven't been answered for them, unfortunately. Um, and many times it can be discouraging. I've seen it all the time where, where people, they're, they're like, I've been praying for this for years and it still hasn't happened. And it can be discouraging from a life of prayer. 
uh, from praying at all even, you know. And I think that there are reasons why you and I as believers don't pray as often as we should, that we don't pray more. And I think the first reasons why we don't pray more is because we lack focus. And I don't know about you, but there's, almost every time I go to pray, it could be a short prayer or a long prayer, I don't have ADD, but I feel like ADD kicks in every time I go to pray. You with me there? It's like you start praying and all of a sudden it, it's, it's been like 45 seconds and you're like, man, my phone's going off. I'm starting to think about different things. I just said something in our prayer and I'm like, why did I even say that? You know, you get those spam calls that come in 39 times a day, a day and you have to answer those, right? Because those are fun. They're fun to talk to those people. I never say, I never know what's going to come out of my mouth. And so I have to see what's going to happen. And so I have to answer those. And then there's like things like Facebook and social media and stuff and Instagram. You know, you start scrolling and you're, you're trying to see what your friends and family are up to. And, you know, you just started praying, but now you're scrolling through Facebook and stuff. And then you're like, I mean, why is this ad here? I just talked about this four minutes ago with my friend, and you're like, what in the world? And then all of a sudden, you're clicking on these ads going, I really shouldn't buy this. And now you've spent the next you know, 30 minutes, you just wasted it thinking about what not to buy or something. You know, most mornings, for me personally, I wake up and, and I, try to, I try to be in a habit of praying as I get ready and stuff for the gym and stuff. And I go to the gym before most people are awake. But because of that, you know, halfway through the day, uh, I, it's like one or two o'clock and I'm like, all right, now I'm feeling a little drowsy. I'm on my, I don't know, 7,000th cup of coffee or something by this point. I'm trying to stay awake and stuff. And in those moments, I, I, I try to schedule sometimes midday for just a few minutes to just to, to stop and pray and, and to thank God for things, you know. And, and whenever I do that, sometimes I'm like dozing off a little bit. And, and so I have to pray when I pray alone like that. I have to try to keep my eyes open. And so because otherwise, next thing you know, I'm like in this daze and I, I'm dreaming about being on this 30 plus foot center console boat and, it, you know, owning it and fishing for the big fish every day because I would do that if I could. But it's so easy to get distracted and lose your focus. Another reason why we don't pray is because we lack confidence. If you and I were, if you and I were both being honest with each other, in the grand scheme of things, it can be hard to imagine the creator, right? The, the, the king of the universe and all of humanity, the savior of the world. It's hard to imagine that we can do it right, that we can pray right. And so we, we lack confidence. You know, we really just don't know how to do it. Are we doing it right? Is he hearing me at all? Is he listening? There's like two million people praying probably at this exact second. So I don't even know if he's hearing me. We start to question things like that. And look, there are some people out there that are just incredible. They're, we, we call them intercessory war, uh, prayer warriors. Sometimes you pray with them and you're like, you know what, I think it's just best to let them handle it because they know what they're saying. I'm just going to let them, I'm just going to listen. You know, and they're like, the, they're like the Navy SEALs of prayer, right? The special forces. The, the, I like to call them the MLP, like the major league prayers, you know? And so they, they start praying and you're like, I can't even keep up with this. And they're like saying things, they're Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi. And you're like, Jehovah what now? What is Jehovah Nisan? Like what is, I... Okay, I'm just going to let you pray. And you, can, you, know, you, you go on this thing, especially, it, it can be intimidating, you know. And then you think, and sometimes you think, man, goodness, I've been, these people have been praying for 13 minutes, and now they're looking at me like I'm supposed to pray, and I got nothing more than 45 seconds. And so you give them that, and you don't know what else to say after that. Sometimes we lack focus, sometimes we lack confidence, but more oftentimes, all of us can, would have probably been in this situation where we lack faith. And I know for me and for a lot of people in the room, for the sake of being honest and throwing this out there so you don't feel alone, I have faith most of the time. It, it can, it, sometimes it can be difficult to, to be optimistic about things. You know, I tend to think about all possible outcomes of every scenario that I'm in, of every situation. And so I have moments where I'm optimistic, where I'm positive about something. And then there's the moments where I'm like, I don't even know why we're having this conversation. There is nothing good that's going to come out of this. It's all, it's all negative. It's all downhill from here. And, and so whenever I pray, I, I tend to pray and ask God constantly, like almost all, probably three or four times a week, I'm asking God to, to strengthen the discernment in my life, the, the, the spiritual gift of discernment in my life. And a lot of times I'm able to discern things, but that's not always the case. You know, because of things that have happened in my life, because of the ways that I've been treated here and there and, and you know, growing up, oftentimes when it comes to my own life, I tend to, to think down on myself. I, I think things that are negative about myself and about the situation sometimes. And, you know, even while I'm praying, 
And then afterwards, you know, it's like that moment whenever you, you go to buy a car and, or a truck or something, and you're like, I really shouldn't. It's, it's, it's unaffordable, but I really want it. And so you get it. And then you go out to eat, and you're like, hey, let's celebrate. I got this new truck. I'm going to pick you up, babe. You go pick up your wife, and then you get to the, the steakhouse, and then all of a sudden, that buyer's remorse, the buyer's regret kick, kicks in, and you're like, I shouldn't have done that. That's me after praying sometimes. I'll pray, and then all of a sudden, it's like, ah, I start getting these negative feelings. It's because we lack faith. You know, sometimes you pray and things happen, and then sometimes you forget to pray, and the thing that you forgot to pray about still happens, and that can be confusing. And then oftentimes you pray hard and nothing changes, or, or you know, maybe it gets worse. You know, you might be praying for a situation at work to get better, but it seems like nothing is going right. Or maybe as a kid you prayed for your parents' relationship to get better, and instead they got a divorce. Or maybe you prayed for a relative to be healed. And it looked like it was going to happen, but then all of a sudden they passed away. So what happens next? Oftentimes, we find ourselves giving up. Have you heard? I, I grew up hearing a quote in sports especially, but I, I heard this quote uh, several times from a few of my different coaches that I had where they said, nothing ever becomes real till it's experienced. And for the longest time, I was like, yeah, right on. That's so true. And I think it can be true for a lot of things in life. Experiences truly can inform you about what's going on around you, but sometimes it can actually deceive you and hold you back. You know, because although experiences are meant to inform you and to teach you, only God's word is the truth. And his word is meant to not just inform you, but to form you on the deepest level. That's only God's word. So here's what I'll say. No matter where you're at with prayer, whether you are starting your walk with Christ and, and you just, you're brand new to it or you've neglected praying for years maybe or, or maybe you've just never learned how to pray or maybe you've tried and you really just you feel like you don't know how or maybe you've tried to pray and you thought nothing came of it and so there's kind of no point is what you're thinking, right? So just, I want you to take all of those experiences and I want you to put them under the microscope of God's Word and just kind of put them off to the side for a second because we're going to open up the Word and we're going to learn about what the Bible says about what a church is a, a, about a church that prays. So, <coughs> excuse me. So I'm going to talk to you real quick about uh, Jesus' disciples. You know, there's 12 disciples. Jesus was here on earth for what, 33 years. He was in ministry for like three years, three and a half years, something like that. And so, you know, he had 12 disciples through this three years. And, and in his three years, these 12 disciples walked with him everywhere. They, I mean, when I say they walked with him everywhere, I mean, they... They were with, they lived with him, they traveled with him. I'm not talking about how you and I do church, where you go to church on a Sunday morning for one of the three services, and then you show up at Life Group, if you show up at all, on a Friday night or something. That's, that's not walking with him. When I say walking with him, I mean they did everything with Jesus. They were always with him. And as they were with him, they got to witness so many different things. I mean, they got to see the dead risen. They, they got to see water turn into wine. How many of you would have liked to see that? It was pretty cool. They saw Jesus walk on water. Man, this is recorded too. They saw Jesus walk on water and Peter's experience with him on the water. They saw Jesus cast out demons from people who were oppressed for decades. At that, They, they were with Jesus as he healed and healed and healed people, just person after person in these crowds. And yet it was only recorded that they ever asked him to teach him to teach them one thing. They didn't ask Jesus to teach them to heal the sick or to raise the dead. They didn't ask him to teach them to multiply bread. That's probably what I would ask because then Texas Roadhouse would have been, you know, I would have been having Texas Roadhouse rolls all the time. They didn't ask him to, to help him, to, to teach them how to walk on water, which would have been really cool too, or even to preach. They asked Jesus to teach them to pray. It shows that in, in Luke 11, chapter 1, it says, they simply asked him, Lord, teach us to pray. And of all the things they could have asked for, they asked him to teach them to pray. You know, they watched all the things that he did, and they seen, they witnessed all these different things, and yet the, the, the biggest thing for them was the witness of, uh, of the power of prayer in his life. So here's a question for you. If the Son of God relied on the power of prayer and his closest people, the closest people to him, saw that prayer was a secret of his life to his life and his success, how much more do you and I need prayer in our own lives? I mean, I mean how, how much do we need prayer at, at, at our church, in church today? I mean, I would say it's pretty important. I want to make a bit of a scriptural base for you real quick, because, you know, I'm not going to read them all, so you may want to take a picture of the screen. 
Uh, but you know, a pastor can say a lot of things from the stage because we have the microphone, but if there's no scriptural background to it, if there's no scriptural base to it, then it's just nothing but words. And so the, you know, the Bible is the strongest foundation of which we can build our lives. And so I want to make sure that, that you guys see these scriptures. But Jesus prioritized prayer in his life. I mean, he, in the presence of God, he, he prioritized it in everything that he did. So in Luke 3.21, before Jesus was baptized, there was prayer. In Luke 5.16, when crowds were following him, they prayed. In 6.12, before he chose his disciples, he prayed. In 9.16, before feeding thousands of people, he prayed. In verse 18, before asking his disciples a question, he prayed about that too. In 28, before his encounter with Moses and Elijah, he prayed. And then in 11.1, like we said already, he taught his disciples how to pray in that in that verse. And then in, in 18, 1, he taught how to pray again and how to never give up. In 22, verses 32, he prayed for Peter before he denied him. I don't, that'd be really hard to do. In 22, verses 41, he prayed before he was arrested. In 23, 34, for the people who, would, who nailed him to the cross, he prayed for them too. And then in 23, 46, before he took his last breath, he prayed, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. This pattern of prayer, it didn't just stop with Jesus. His prayers made such an impression on the disciples that they, they, you see it at the forefront of the early church and everything that we read about the early church. I mean, here's another list for you that you can take a picture of. In Acts 1, they prayed before Pentecost and before choosing leaders. In, in, in chapter 2, they prayed after the church grew to 3,000. In chapter 4, they prayed when they were persecuted for God to make them bolder. In, in chapter 6, the apostles prioritized prayer and the ministry of the word. In chapter 8, they prayed for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They prayed for the sick. They prayed for Cornelius who got saved. They prayed for Peter to be released from prison, and he was. They prayed for God to send out missionaries. They prayed for the appointed elders. They prayed in prison and saw God set them free, and the jailer even got saved. They prayed for uh, before departing to another church. They prayed for Paul before he went to Jerusalem. They prayed and worshiped receiving guidance for future plans, and they even prayed for signs and wonders. I mean, the, the, the prayer is biblical, and it's very important in the church. I, I've said this many times before, but anytime you see repetition in the Bible, it's like an exclamation mark in the English language, right? You, or for the younger folk, it's like an emoji in a text message. It's how you emphasize something. And by the way, the poop emoji is the best. Hands down, you can't argue with me there. It's, uh, some people think it's ice cream. It might be ice cream, I don't know. But in the Bible, we emphasize things through repetition. And so prayer was clearly not optional. It was non-negotiable. And if Jesus and the early church felt like they could do nothing on their own and, and knew they needed the Father's help, his strength, and his guidance, why would we think we're any different? In Matthew 21, 13, it says, He said to them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer. And as we talk about prayer and as we face things in our own life, I think it's sometimes important to think about what something is not. Because when you understand what something isn't, then you, you kind of get some clarity on what you're trying to understand and what you're going through, right? So prayer is not formal. Prayer is not formal. You don't have to kneel down all the time. You don't have to speak in the King James language because that would be weird. Now, I've heard some religious people that, that, you know, they talk like I'm talking to you now, but when they pray, all of a sudden they're like, thus saith me to God, to you. You know, they say all these words. You don't have to say these words. Prayer doesn't have to be uh, other people's words. It just has to be your own. Another thing that prayer is not is prayer is not wishing. I, I think that this is another misconception that many people have, that God is like some genie in the bottle and you rub him a certain way and, you know, and all of a sudden you get what you want, right? That, that's, not, that's not how it works. That's Christina Aguilera. Or Aladdin if, and Will Smith, if you don't know who Christina is. But prayer is also not a negotiation. You know, you ever catch yourself trying to negotiate with God? I, I do this probably every, every time I pray. I'm guilty as charged. But you'd be like, God, I, if you get me out of this, I promise. And you say that, you know, like, I promise I'll never eat that disgusting In-N-Out burger again. I know Kim's in the room, Matt's, Pastor Matt's sister, so I'm sure he'll hear about that. But, you know, you'll, you, you see, God, I promise I'll never get on this website again. God, I promise I'll never do this or do that. I promise I'll never talk to my wife like that again. If you would just, if you would, I mean, what are your, what are you promising God? 
God knows from you from beginning to the end. He created you and he knows your end. He knows everything in between. There, it's not a negotiation. The fourth one is that prayer is not to earn God's favor. Now, this is very, really important you know, as we talk about why we should pray, but we don't. It's not about, I, I want you to know, it's not about guilt and shame. Jesus, it says in the Bible that, that he died once and for all. And he did that to make us right with God. Now, it's up to us to decide how much we want to engage with the Creator and how much we want to engage with our Savior. So now that we've talked about what prayer is not, I'm going to lay out what prayer is and why it's essential in the church. You know, let's, it's, it's important for us to understand both sides of the story. And so it, I, I would say this, if, if, we, if, if it was a if it was made a big deal in Jesus' ministry, if prayer was such a big thing for him that he talked about it all the time and he taught about it and he did it all the time, don't you think that it would make a world of a difference in our world today? If, if we prayed and if the church as a whole just prayed together. But prayer is essential. And the first point today is that prayer creates int- intimacy with God. Now this is about relationship, right? So prayer actually builds the relationship that starts when you uh, surrender your life to Christ. Now, do me a favor real quick. Now, I want you to think about, let's say, one person, the, the, the person that is closest to you in your life, and I bet that you would text or call that person more than anyone else, right? You know them really well. You, you talk to them a lot. You spend time with them. You just know everything about them. Just imagine it like this in two different scenarios. You got two businessmen who, who work together, who make money together. They, they know each other in that way. They know what each other would decide in a business situation, but their relationship is all business. And you got two people who fell in love, two people who they spend time, t- uh, hours and hours talking, usually about nothing, and they just love being with each other. There's no agenda at all. I mean, it's like when I met Michelle and we started hanging out as friends and talking to each other and stuff, uh, my wife and I, she, I would call her as soon as I woke up because I just wanted to hear her voice. I wanted to know if she slept well. And then that would start our day of texting all day long. She'd be texting me like, why aren't you answering me? And I'm like, because oh, I'm working. And then I'm like, you know, it just goes back and forth. And then we would see each other sometimes before and during work and then after. And then we started working together. It didn't matter. What, whatever we wanted, we, we just wanted to know each other so we wanted to be connected. And so we would even go home and we, you know, back then we didn't have FaceTime. Uh, this was around the time that the first iPhone was announced, not even came, didn't even come out yet. But FaceTime wasn't a thing, so we'd get on video chat and, and have our computers open, and we'd be doing things around the house and talking to each other and stuff, and not even talking anymore. We're just sitting there because we just wanted to be connected. That's, how, that's what I'm talking about here. It's, it's intimacy with God. So I'm going to ask you real quick, is, is God useful or is he beautiful to you? Is he useful like the business person or is he beautiful like the person you fell in love with? Because if he's just useful, then you'll need to discipline yourself to pray. But do you pray to get something from God or do you pray to get more of God? Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us boldly, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy and we will find grace to help us when we need it most. You know, this is really important because as I live out this life, and by the way, none of us in here are perfect. We're all going through this process trying to be, trying to be more like Jesus. You know, this process called sanctification. It's, it's essentially, if you think about it, it's the already but not yet phase of our existence. We, we are learning and we're growing. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to mess up. And I think it's important that we talk about coming to God in prayer and coming boldly. It's important to know that we can come boldly to his throne for two reasons. It's said in that scripture for, because of, we get his mercy and we find his grace. Now, mercy and grace are different. And you need to really understand this, that mercy is God doesn't give us what we deserve. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad about that because I don't deserve what he gives me. But grace is God gives us something that we could never earn through Christ. And because of the mercy and because of the grace, we can all go boldly to his throne. You know, I've, I've been in ministry for a long time, and I grew up around pastors. My parents were, were in ministry, and, and I've noticed that for whatever reason, people tend to act weird until they, until they really know you. They tend to act weird around pastors. You know, there was one time I was... I was in the bathroom um, at my last church, actually, and I was just, like, washing my hands and stuff, and this guy walks in, and he stops dead in his tracks, and it takes me you know, by surprise, because I'm like, why does this person stop like that? So I turn around, 
And he's like, whoa, I never thought I'd have a chance to meet you. And I'm like, all right, that's where I'm just a normal dude, man. Like, I'm always in the lobby talking to people. Like, you can find me anywhere. If I'm not on the stage, I'm everywhere else in the building walking around and stuff. But I mean, that's just, people, people don't realize, we're just normal people just doing what God called us to do. We're, we're, we want to... We, we want to be in relationship with people, but even when I was a volunteer and when I was part-time, especially when I was uh, in this thing, in, in ministry full-time, it's just, it's just always been like that for whatever reason. Now, on the other hand, my daughter, who's with me all the time, who, who has an intimate relationship with me, she doesn't get nervous around me. She will you body slam my office door to get in, and she will you know, interrupt conversations when I, even when I tell her not to. She'll ask me for things that she wants. Like right before we started the first service, she was like begging me to go to, to, go to 7-Eleven with her. And so I brought her after service, of course, because I had to come up here. But you know, she, she does all these things because she knows she doesn't need to earn my attention or my affection. I mean, she drew me a picture two years ago, and I came across it and was like, you know what? I love that. I'm going to get a tattoo tomorrow. So I got this tattoo of her drawing. It says, I love you, Daddy, on it. It was just last week, actually. And so, like, you know, I, I know for some of us, you didn't have a good father. Maybe, maybe he failed you or neglected you or abandoned you. Maybe he criticized you or, or abused you. And if that's you, I want you to hear me. I'm so sorry about that, but, but that's not God's desire. So, so rather than seeing your heavenly father from the lens of the earthly one, evaluate your earthly father from the lens of your heavenly one. Because the heavenly one says he loves you, he thinks about you, he's with you, he's waiting to spend time with you, he's never going to fail you. He wants to be in an intimate relationship with you. But also keep in mind, church, that intimacy is not just created with your heavenly father. It's also created with your spiritual brothers and sisters. It's, it's this thing that we're doing called church. The house of prayer. Number two today is that prayer lifts our burdens. Not only does it create intimacy with God, but prayer lifts our burdens. How many of you would agree that we live in the probably the most difficult time in the history of the world right now? And some of you are like, well, I don't know, my day 50 years ago was pretty tough. And I can I promise you, every decade had its problems, but if you compare today versus five years ago, ten years ago, five hundred years ago, today is it's just, it's mind-blowing, crazy. In Psalms 55, 22, it says, give your burdens to the Lord, and he will take care of you. If you read it from the NIV, which is, I grew up reading this particular scripture in the NIV, and it says, cast your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. You know, cast literally means to throw, and, and the cares that they're talking about here, they're defined as your burdens. So God did not design prayer to put a burden on you. He designed prayer to take a burden off of you. So when, when you look at it this way, it doesn't take much discipline. You know, you should be thinking, I, I don't get stressed anymore when I pray about stuff, but I get stressed when I don't pray about it. Because, y'all, you, you can only carry a burden as far as what you, you put it like this. You can boldly go to the throne of God. You have access to him. And when you are carrying your burden on your own, there's only a small distance that you are allowed to carry that because you're sheep. We, the Bible says that we were made as sheep. We are sheep. Sheep are not burden-bearing animals. You can only carry your burden to the feet of Jesus, and that's where you have to leave it. Point number three today is prayer changes things. You know, many of our failures in prayer are not because we are asking too much, but we are asking too little. I've I've heard this term being thrown around in the Christian world for a long time where they talk about an unspoken prayer. You know, that's not really a prayer, by the way. Prayer is spoken. It comes out of your mouth. You know, when I pray, I like to pray out loud because the Bible teaches us that, that faith comes by hearing. And so when I pray out loud, I'm building my faith, you know? And, and I mean, it's the same way when the Bible talks about your salvation. It says that you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. And so... I believe that praying out loud is what's best for a person. And you might be thinking, well, I like to pray quietly in my own head. And I'm not dogging on you for that. I think, I think as long as you're praying, great. But I do, I do hope and pray that you have people around you that are praying with you and out loud. And I'm also not saying that because you're praying out loud, now everybody knows your business, everyone knows your situation that you're in. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, I'm also saying that's not a bad thing if certain people in your life, if you are surrounded by people who love you and that are praying for you and, and that are, that are Bible believing people that will point you in the right direction and, and give you wisdom and be, be there for you and holding you up when, in times of need, 
it's not a bad, bad deal for these people to know what you're praying about, what you, need, what you have needs for, because you can't carry your burden alone. You're not designed to carry your burden alone. You're, you're designed to do this together in this thing called church. The Bible teaches us that we are designed to carry not our burdens, but we are to help each other, help one another, and point them in the direction of the cross so that they can drop it at the feet of Jesus. Now, I heard a story about Alexander the Great, and this is what it says. It says, one of his generals came to him and said, I have served you faithfully for years. I've never asked you for anything. Now I have one request. And Alexander said, what is it? And the general said, I would like you to pay for my daughter's wedding. Well, you have served me faithfully all these years, Alexander said. I will happily pay for, his we- for this wedding. Go and speak to my treasurer about it. So a few days later, the treasurer came to talk to Alexander, and he said, you need to punish that general. He said, he's trying to take advantage of you. He's requesting funds for the greatest wedding the empire has ever seen. He's invited everyone. He's taking advantage of your generosity. And Alexander said, no, dude. I mean, if you talk like we do today, I kind of paraphrase that. <laughs> said, no, I want to give him everything that he's asking for. And and his treasurer said, but why? And he goes, because he's paying me two compliments. First, he thinks I'm wealthy enough to afford all of this. And second, he thinks I'm generous enough to give it. What if we acted that way to God? I I, I don't want us to be a big church that prays small prayers. Y'all, we should be praying huge, bold prayers that only God can get credit for. In Acts 12, 5, it says, So Peter was kept in prison. This is one of my favorite passages, by the way. Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And you know the story. He prayed out loud. He worshiped all night. Uh, An earthquake came. He was breaking free of the the chains. There's an author named Thomas Watson that made this statement about about this passage. He said, The angel fetched Peter out of prison. But it was prayer that fetched the angel. So does Peter get released if the church doesn't pray? Your prayers are not meant to be therapeutic. I know sometimes after you get done praying, sometimes you feel better. But they're not meant to be therapeutic. They are meant to accomplish things. So how many of you need a miracle or you know someone who does and, and, and you know, you're, you're uh, I want to ask you, if you know these people or you are that person, are you praying with expectation? Because if you are, really, you will start to see the supernatural become natural to you. The fourth point is prayer expands the church. So if the church is God's plan A for the darkness in our world, his work in us also and through us as believers, if that's his plan A, then the reason that Jesus prioritized it is because it built and it expanded the church. There's a story in Mark 4 where, you know, Jesus was on this boat, right, and, and his disciples are there, and Jesus went to go take a nap because naps were awesome. And you remember the story, right? There's a storm that happened, and his disciples are, like, freaking out, and, and they're just, they don't know what to do, and so they wake Jesus up, and Jesus stands up, and he's like, I got this. Peace be still. And all of a sudden, the storm stops, right? Now these disciples are they're freaking out even more, and they're going, uh, who is this man that even the, the winds and the waves obey him? Well, I want you to pay attention real quick to this story. The the storm was not about Jesus. It It wasn't about him taking a nap. It wasn't about him resting or anything like that. This this storm wasn't about the storm. It wasn't about the disciples. The storm was about the enemy blocking Jesus from his next assignment. Because if you pay attention right after this passage, what happens in in chapter 5, he gets off the boat and a man... That was demon-possessed named Legion came and approached him. It says in in, uh, chapter 5, verses 9, it says, He was asking him, what's your name? And he he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he began begging him repeatedly not to send them out of that region. Why did the enemy send this storm to try and block Jesus from this assignment, from from this place? It's because 6,000 demons had been building strongholds in this region. The the story was never about one particular man or one of the disciples or Jesus. This story was about this region. And you know, 
we are in this battle that I would say is a spiritual one, and that's it's, it's manifested around us every single day, everywhere we look. We talk about our, our we're in a battle for our kids and their minds, our marriages, our neighborhood, our schools, our workplaces, our cities, our states, our nations, our entire world. But when Jesus stepped foot in this region, all of hell was put on notice. And this is what prayer does in your life too. When you pray, all of hell is put on notice. And then in verse 18, it says, As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed began to go with him. But Jesus said, No, go home to your family and tell them everything the Lord has done for you and how merciful he has been. So the man started off to visit ten visit the 10 towns of that region and begin to proclaim the great things Jesus had done for them. You know, in these 10 regions, you you see 10, you you see uh, just incredibly influential churches sprout up from them, from this particular passage even. I mean, this story, you start to see incredibly influential churches sprout up. Many of them existed in that day, I believe, so that we would exist today. This is a, I want you to, somebody in here needs to hear that there is a region that there is a region that God has you on assignment for. That there is an assignment for you to go to that region and they need to hear what God is doing in your life and through your life and what your story is. Matthew 16, verses 18, it says, and, and I tell you, you are Peter. Remember, this is our, our, our scripture for the series. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I'm going to talk to you real quick about this particular uh, this verse real quick from a different perspective, uh, from a perspective of offense versus defense. You know, for a long time, I grew up probably my entire life thinking that the church was on the inside of this gate being protected. You ever heard the term whenever you're praying and you hear people say, may a hedge of protection be around you? You know, that's what I always think. Like the church is inside these gates. And I was always referring to this scripture. The gates of hell shall now prevail against you. So we're, we're protected. But you know what gates were designed to do, right? They're designed to keep people out. They're designed to keep the bad out. Gates are, an, are they're not an offensive weapon. They are a defensive thing. So what would happen if we read this first the way that it was intended? You know, as believers, as God is building this church, his church, we aren't supposed to be reactive to everything. We aren't supposed to be on our heels in defense we are actually supposed to be leaning in and taking offense. We are supposed to be taking ground for the kingdom of God. I mean, just because the world is, is raging around us, it doesn't mean that we sit back on our hills. Listen, churches that pray, churches that, that take their offense seriously are the ones that move forward and do incredibly great things. So what Jesus is saying in that scripture is not that hell won't be able to plunder our kingdom, but that Satan will be unable to keep us from plundering his kingdom. It's not that hell won't be able to plunder our kingdom, but that Satan will be unable to keep us out. Listen, because, you know, hell has gates around the entertainment industry. If you look at any movie out there, even Christian movies nowadays, if you, music, the music industry, everything, everywhere you look, there is hell's gates set up, or even your family. Hell does not want God's people to get in because what happens when we do get in is that we have the authority to make a difference. When when a church prays, we go from playing defense to playing offense. And then in verse 19 of the same scripture, it says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Listen, God is waiting for someone to use the keys that he has already given us. And I think it should be us. So as we end every service here at ACC, I want you to ask this question to yourself. Ask yourself, what now, God? You know, I, I, earlier I said that I was going to challenge you to pray. And, 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 you know, there's a scripture in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 that says, never stop praying. As simple as that. Never stop praying. You know, it, it used to, praying all day used to, to kind of make me feel guilty because I knew there was no way that I could pray all day long without getting tired, without having to stop, you know, just... I mean, just think about talking for three services in a row and singing for three services in a row. That wears me out. So praying all day, there's no way. I would think like that. But look, you can pray anywhere. You can pray while you're driving. You can pray while you're working. You can pray while you're parenting and cleaning and teaching things and listening to things. I mean, anything ends with an ing, adulting. 
general. You can pray during it. Prayer can happen in a place, but it's much more about living in God's presence. Prayer is hearing his whisper throughout the day. It's, it's, it's enjoying his power and his presence and his peace throughout your day. So I'd encourage you, I challenge you to pray. Start your day with prayer, but don't end it. Don't say in Jesus' name, amen, until you're ready to end it. But start your day, and then throughout your day, just spend time as you're driving. Spend time as you are doing life in the presence of God just by talking to him in the way that you would talk to your best friends and to your family even. So church, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God, we, we love you. We're so grateful for you, God. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to keep our, our eyes on you. Help us to learn to pray the way that you have taught us, Father. God, I pray, Lord, that as we move this week throughout our week uh, in our daily lives, Father, I pray, Lord, that that uh, that we would be able to pursue you with a passion, Father, that we would remember, Father, that, that, that you are the center of our lives, Father. You are the creator. And God, I pray, Lord, that we can please you by being connected to you. Father, I pray, Lord, that we would be more connected to you than ever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we, as a church, are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on Sunday mornings. Please remember this, you belong at ACC.